Okay, and next up we have Aaron Romanovsky talking to us about global clusters. Um, global clusters at high redshift. Uh, starting to talk about those observationally for the first time, which is really fun. Um, of course, this is a low redshift observation. And long-standing mystery, anyone who's ever looked at a picture of a globular cluster, um, is where and when did these, and how did these things originate? And uh, many, many decades of work over the years trying to figure that out, but we have a completely new window with JWST of trying to answer that question. So as a uh, kind of a overall reminder, this is, I'm gonna talk about the overall structure of the Milky Way globular cluster system. In broad strokes, what we know about it. I'm gonna uh, show three subsystems of the Milky Way system. Uh, this is what we'll call the inner halo uh, with metal poor clusters. Uh, the bulge or disk component of metal rich clusters. And a third component, you might have often heard about metal rich versus metal poor, but the metal poor ones seem to in sort of two subsystems, the outer halo, which has quite a few distinctions relative to the inner halo. So where do these originate? Uh, the broad thinking right now in, in very simple terms is that this inner halo comes from in-situ formation, high redshift, and early mergers, uh, the early times in the Milky Way. This metal rich uh, would be a later in-situ component associated with the formation of the bulge, you know, how, however that formed. And then at later times, this uh, outer halo would be later accretion of the minor mergers, which we see happening at, at this day. Things like Sagittarius dwarf is depositing uh, globular clusters at this very day. And with Gaia, you can decompose the phase-based coordinates of a lot of outer halo clusters and find individual accretion events. Broadly speaking, how we think uh, the Milky Way um, system formed, but there's, there's not very quantitative in terms of how and when. So in terms of when, uh, this is a state of the art of just trying to directly determine ages of globular clusters through conventional color magnitude um, diagram of main sequence fitting or uh, uh, white dwarf cooling sequence. And uh, this is sort of a, uh, a compendium of results of the ages of the clusters and their metallicities, again broken into those three components, where you have very, very old globular clusters, which at one point were contradicting cosmology, cosmological age of the universe. Um, that's now a solved problem at the moment, we think. Uh, there's this branch of outer halo clusters which are the younger, the accreted components, so that kind of makes sense that these are formed in, in dwarf galaxies which accrete later or are younger. But most of the clusters are in this old component here of, uh, say, of over more than 10 giga years. And if you translate that to redshift, talking about redshifts 3 up to 10. Now, unfortunately, you know, there's obviously a lot of interesting action in that redshift range. and this sort of a low redshift fitting of uh, CMDs is not, never gonna give quite the precision that we want to address a pretty broad range of formation redshifts. Um, so a little bit about globular cluster formation theory. Uh, very broadly speaking, it's agreed that you need a lot of gas. If you form a 10 to the six solar mass cluster, you need a lot more gas than that. You need to compress it uh, to high densities, high pressures, and the, the natural places to do that are in starbursts, especially merger-driven starbursts, which we see in the present day forming mass, young massive clusters. It looks something like this. Now, actually, doing a full end-to-end uh, -end simulation is not yet possible. At the subparsec level, you need to resolve the the clusters. So when people try to do this high, high resolution, it, you have to stop your simulation at pretty high redshift. So the other approach that's done is, is a subgrid modeling of tagging particles and gas particles and star particles as globular clusters and trying to model over the full uh, range of redshifts over what happens to the present day. And it's really important to remember that it's not just how do you form globular clusters, but how do you not destroy globular clusters because they can easily get disrupted in high density regions, uh, particularly at high redshift. Huge range of ongoing projects uh, to try to model this all the way up to the present day. So, I'll show now an uh, example of where things stand on the Milky Way. There have been several studies of the Milky Way globular cluster system and simulations, and um, most of these are sort of based on the e-mosaics, which is pretty much the state-of-the-art globular cluster system modeling. And it's these contours here showing the predicted age metallicity relation for a uh, Milky Way mouse galaxy, and you'll see this track. It looks, uh, the metal poor ones start early, and then they form a uh, metal rich at lower redshift, as you might expect. The problem is, when you compare that to the actual data of the Milky Way, here are these red points. Uh, these the simulations, they really resemble that young halo track of the Milky Way, 
But what they're not seeing is this old component. Now, of course, the old metal poor, you know, there's some wiggle room here, but it gets a little more tricky when these old metal rich ones are in here, these near solar metallicity ones that are you know, more than 10 gig years old. It creates some potential tension. Now, there's a, there's a one way out of this is that I mean, if, you, if you simulate a suite of, say, 20 of these galaxies, uh, then there's one or two of these that actually does agree more with the Milky Way. So it could be that just the Milky Way is an unusual outlier. If we were to get this sort of observational data for a bunch of nearby spiral galaxies like we're still not able to do, they might agree with this on, on average. And so it might be that the Milky Way just has this unusually uh, quiescent recent history and didn't form globular clusters later. Or it could be that uh, Milky Way is normal for a spiral galaxy and that the globular cluster models need some revising. Um, so I say revising, what are some other possibilities? Um, we saw unconventional models. Uh, I'd say, that for reference, conventional models are that globular clusters just form along with normal star formation processes that we're familiar with. It's just early times. You've got more gas, higher densities and pressures. You form more globular clusters um, above redshift of one. But there's all sorts of exotic formation scenarios some people in the room have, have worked on um, as alternatives, if for some reason these, these conventional models are not quite working out, there's other things to consider, which I really don't have time to, to cover. But it's kind of a part of the basis of what I'm going to talk about later from the observational side. Um, so the, the really nice thing about going to high redshift is that right now, globulars, although they're, they're spectacular at redshift of zero, they're a very small minority of the stars in the universe. But being the oldest star, so among the oldest stars, it means if you go to high enough redshift, they become a very dominant component. You know, one estimate is at redshift of five. It should be about half of your stars should be in globular clusters or their progenitors. Um, there has been some work done with HST to try to see globular clusters at high redshift uh, using lenses to you know, magnify background sources. A couple of examples, uh, and uh, Richard has, has shown this over the years about some compact possible galaxies, possible superstar clusters at high redshift. With HST, the resolutions are not quite there to really tell what these are, uh, if they're star clusters or galaxy or compact galaxies. This is where JWST comes in. And I feel like um, it's potentially a game changer for globular clusters, where with high redshift galaxies, you sort of uh, pre-JWST, you're, you're already starting to see them. With globular clusters, we'd, we're not really seeing them before JWST. So it's a, it's a real phase shift, potentially, in the field. Um, here is uh, examples, which I'm not really going to talk about, but just to show a couple examples of JWST of some high redshift sources. Uh, this is redshift of four, uh, similar to the other ones I showed. Of, uh, we're now, they're now starting to resolve things down to three parsecs, and getting these are more bona fide star cluster sizes. Also, this is a redshift of six, some of them down to order of one parsec in sizes. So uh, starting to uh, resolve star cluster type sources in these high redshift galaxies. I've not worked on this one, so I'm not going to talk about these two systems further, but I'm going to talk about something called the sparkler, um, which is a, a background source in the first uh, deep field at JWST of uh, this, this cluster, which uh, is becoming very familiar now. And the three images here, which are, here's the zoom ends of this background galaxy, um, and uh, this is the, the most magnified one, so that's the one I'll, I'll focus on the most. And this was first discussed by Maula and Ayer et al., um, and just for context, uh, where does this sparkler galaxy fit on a cosmological growth chart? This is one example of a growth curve. It's here at redshift of 1.4, 10 to the 9 stellar mass. Um, so we're talking about potentially a Milky Way mass if you get to redshift of zero. Now, there's some uncertainties in these curves. But we could potentially be looking at the, the progenitor of a, a Milky Way type galaxy at this uh, you know, half the age of the universe or, um, uh, or before that. And uh, um, so what's fun about this is that all of a sudden it helps us really resolve some of these age problems. So these radically different models where you're forming uh, collaborative clusters at redshift of 2 versus 10, for example, when you measure those differences at redshift of 0, you're talking about measuring an age difference of 2 or 3 giga years, which is kind of hard to be sure about. But when you're observing that at redshift of 1.4, you're measuring the difference between 1 and 4 giga years, which is now, in principle, well within the range of stellar population modeling, being able to measure that difference. So that's why it's really powerful. Even though we're not necessarily looking back at these highest redshifts where you think they might form, just by pushing this, this age limit, uh, the age of observation much higher, it makes a big difference. So, okay, here's, uh, this is from Mala et al. 
And um, uh, they've done some SED modeling of these uh, clusters here using a, a certain code to do that fitting for all the different parameters, age, metallicity, dust. Um, and they get clump masses of, say, about 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 7th. Now, that's highly uncertain, mostly because the magnifications are highly uncertain. So that's going to come a little bit into uh, the results later. But just want to point something out here that's maybe been overlooked and is uh, independent of the magnification, which is that the total mass of those clumps added up is of order of the mass in the galaxy that you can see. Okay, that's totally different from if you look at a galaxy today. Unless you get a cartoon picture, you see these pictures of the Milky Way, and you draw globular clusters, and you'll see them like that. But the, a real galaxy, you look at it, you really squint to have to see the clusters. So these are really dominant component. Um, so whatever, and I'm going to talk about, there's a lot of uncertainties about these results, but this is the key thing to keep in mind, is that this is really unprecedented, seeing this dominant of a cluster population around a relatively massive galaxy like this. And it, it needs to be explained. And hopefully will tell us a lot about globular clusters in general, that this is not some really weird, rare galaxy, but maybe telling us about generic processes. So that's, to, again, to compare to at, at redshift of zero, these would be about 0.1% the mass of, stellar mass of the galaxy. <clears throat> so from this SED fitting, they find some clumps, these ones that are kind of look blue here, they found are young, young clumps, young massive clusters forming in the disk of the galaxy may or may not survive. This is redshift to 1.4. We might expect that to happen. But the big surprise was that a, a bunch of these things that look red here, they were measuring to be around 4 giga years old, which is basically the age of the universe at that, at that redshift. So they're uh, high redshift of formation, not what's expected in conventional models. Um, to compare this to the Milky Way globular cluster system, uh, we put this, uh, we did a, a little paper where we sort of interpreted the data, putting these data points on an age metallicity uh, track. These here, these red points are the uh, sparkler observations. And, uh, and if you compare, I know the legend may be a little hard to see, these asterisks here are Milky Way globular clusters up here. So they match up really well with this uh, metal rich old track for the Milky Way system of like the bulge clusters. And then there's some younger ones here that look a little bit like some of the younger clusters in the Milky Way. They look like um, LMC or Gaia Enceladus secretion event clusters. So it looks like we have those two tracks. Um, what's missing here is in the observations, we're not seeing the old metal poor ones. So that's a bit of a, a, a mystery in, in this uh, data set. So it seems similar to the Milky Way in that respect. If you compare this to now some theoretical models from uh, the eMosaic simulations where you have predictions of this age metallicity track as a function of stellar mass of your host galaxy, this is at redshift of zero, these higher mass Milky Way mass galaxies are just about coming up to where the data points are. So kind of agreeing with that interpretation of a billion Milky Way type progenitor, again, being an outlier bit in the, uh, the age of these uh, metal rich ones. Um, I mean, you do expect them to be more in here. So again, there's some tension, again, similar to the tension that you see in the Milky Way compared to the e mosaics or, or, or any general globular cluster formation model. So, um, yeah, looking at this in a little more detail, if you say, okay, what about the numbers of these clusters? What about the masses? Again, we don't know the magnifications. We don't know the mass loss for the clusters, but if we just kind of scale them and say, well, let's just say these are the most massive clusters in the Milky Way today. If it's a similar galaxy, then that's this orange histogram, and then you match it up to the uh, metal-rich globulars of the Milky Way. It kind of matches up fairly nicely in terms of the masses, and the numbers uh, at, at that mass. But what we are missing are these metal poor ones. Now, most of those are going to be found at larger radius than you can see in this image. I didn't really call out the scale, but it's, a, it's about uh, 5 or 10 kiloparsecs across the image we were looking at. And so if you look at the Milky Way, this is what you would see on that same scale. You'd see, uh, just for the more massive clusters, you'd see a handful of both metal rich and metal poor. So we're, we're seeing a handful of metal rich ones in the sparkler. We're missing the, the metal poor ones, so that's a bit of a, a, a puzzle. We're also missing uh, the bulge. Uh, I've kind of not marked it here, but this is where the bulge would be for the Milky Way. So if these metal rich ones did form with a bulge, then why aren't we seeing the bulge in that, in that high redshift galaxy? So that's another puzzle. Um, it's possible this puzzle is solved with different analyses of the same data. Uh, another group came along shortly after Maula at all and reanalyze the same images, different methods on their, their uh, 
measuring the colors in different, different SCD fits. And so instead of these orange points up here from, from Mala, um, it's these blue points down here which agree a lot more with these uh, more metal poor uh, older populations. So it, it doesn't have these metal rich old ones. So it, it appears to take away the problem that uh, Mala, from the Mala data. Um, I, another paper which was some of the same people from Clayson's took uh, both, they just took both photometric data sets at face value and then fitted with a third round of SCD fitting code and uh, found again results down here that uh, independent of the photometric data sets, they're finding these uh, metal poor clusters. So again, they are finding that this problem goes away. Um, I think it's a little more complicated than that. We're working on looking at, at, at these uh, methods in more detail. So I won't uh, get into that in more detail. Let's just say this is an area of some controversy at this point about how to interpret the results. Um, so they are finding that their old metal poor and young metal rich clusters very much agreeing with a standard model. Um, I don't know about the numbers and how that all fits in with the Milky Way. Uh, in fact, they, they're suggesting that uh, the stellar growth track we used in our curve was, uh, paper was, um, was not the most accurate one to use. And this is more like an M33 progenitor at high redshift. So something a few times 10 to the 9 stellar mass. Um, but uh, hopefully this will all be resolved at, at zeroth order pretty soon. That uh, I'm a very small part of a, a collaboration that has cycle 2 JVST time to get IFU spectroscopy of this object and uh, try to directly measure ages and metallicities using spectra of the globular clusters, using uh, low resolution spectra absorption lines, also uh, uh, mapping out the properties of the host galaxy. So stay tuned. Hopefully this conference a year from now, we might have results to report on that. Um, and hopefully that's just the first of other sources like this. I don't know how many more of these are potentially in uh, observable JWST. But uh, in summary, uh, JWST is now having this totally new window for understanding how globular clusters form. And the sparkler galaxies are a really interesting example. Uh, you know, uh, call it a Rosetta Stone for understanding globular. There's different analyses so far, the same data sets. And hopefully, we're going to resolve that tension with new spectroscopic data. Thanks. Okay, time for questions. So is it agree, agreed that all those, um, those little uh, star-forming clumps are protoglobular clusters? Or could some of those be still, uh, you know, star cluster complexes or association? Do, do, do we know they're all bound, for example, all those? Well, yeah, we don't know if they're going to survive, if that's what you mean. Yeah, that's what I mean is yeah. that, well, I mean, but, but I mean, but do we know that they're currently bound? And I mean, do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. You can have globular clusters that may not survive if uh, they're disrupted. But I'm just wondering if we know that they're all, uh, you know, globular. I mean, protoglobular clusters. I, I think you. Well, that relates a little bit to the time, to the ages. I think you know, if these were all 100 million year old objects, and if some recent accretion event, you have some transient features. But if they're really over one gig year, and everyone, all the groups agree that there's some of these that are more than one gig year old, it's kind of hard to imagine how they would stay as clumps unless they're bound, you know, for several of them for a gig year. I thought you were going to ask if they could be galaxies, which that's another possibility. They could be little, little compact dwarf galaxies. Again, the question is, why would you get a whole bunch of them like that? So what's the current thinking if a bunch of these things, you know, are bound and they they were formed long ago? Like, what's the current thinking on globulars contributing to reionization and some of these earlier things that were carried about? I, mean, I think that maybe depends on a bit on the redshift of formation. If they're if they're forming after redshift of five, then they're not going to contribute. But some of these models, redshift of ten to fifteen, people have talked about that possibly a significant source. I don't I don't know what the latest thinking is on. On that. I mean, it, it, again, it depends, I think, if you're using a conventional or an unconventional model. Mm -hmm. 
do, do you have any comment on the shape of this galaxy? It looks like elongated. Is it this due to tidal feature or length? It's just the lensing. So here, here's the, uh, sorry. Um, you know, I think the real shape is probably closest to this. It looks like a, it looks to me like an LMC type shape. A final question? Okay, um, let's thank Aaron again. Thank you. Yeah. And so we have coffee break now for half an hour and reconvene back at 3.50.